can I ask, how did you get interested in the first place in thinking about the identity of the, the so-called uh, pagans? And maybe you want to comment on that term pagan, if it's the right term to use. Um, yeah. So, um, well, um, I, I think studies on early Islam um, have two shortcomings. Um, one is there's the assumption that the move towards theological and religious stabilization came early. And I don't think that's the case. Um, recent studies, for example, by someone like Shahab Ahmed um, in, in his, not his, what is Islam, which um, is, is different, um, on the satanic verses. Yes, yes. Um, showed us that. Published posthumously of- uh, Yeah, his, I think Princeton yeah. University Press. I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, where he sort of, I thought, demonstrated quite well um, that the theory of doctrine of prophecy did not uh, acquire stability in the first two or three centuries. It, it took two or three centuries before it could sort of settle down and, and, and be accepted um, in its entirety um, that we would later recognize in, in, in sort of the later periods. Um, and this is how he accounted for, you know, readily, some people readily accepting um, certain sort of narratives about the prophet and his reception of the revelation um, and the whole incident of the satanic verses, uh, which, which challenged the, the orthodox position that sort of settled down or emerged after the ninth century. So the point is, I, I suppose, one of the shortcomings is we often um, ignore the fact that before the third, fourth century Hijri or, or, or now century, now 10th century uh, Gregorian, um, the intellectual landscape, intellectual and religious landscape of Islam was diverse, multiple, and nowhere near full um, stability, the full stability that we associate with, with the later period. Um, the second shortcoming is, is what sort of prompted me to study the pagans is in almost every introductory work on Islam, and there are obvious exceptions, there's very little, if any, reference to the religiosity of the so-called so pagans, um, which we call the Quran. We know very little about the worldview, the religiosity, the legal and moral commitments, um, the influences, the customs, and so on. Um, that is, you know, conspicuously absent um, in, in the sources, the secondary literature. Um, mm. So that, that was one of the reasons what, why I decided to sort of embark on this second monograph, which um, at the moment is tentatively titled Monotheism and Paganism in the Quran or in late antique Arabia. And the aim is, is simply to reconstruct the religious um, worldview of the pagans using the Quran and other contemporary sources. And I work with the assumption that the Quran is, is a seventh century source that almost perfectly encapsulates seventh century mentalities and moods and outlooks. Um, and obviously it's, it's a work in progress. Um, it will take me maybe another two years uh, to finish uh, the project. But I, I, I have, of course, um, already come to some very interesting tentative conclusions. Um, the most interesting of which is, as has already been sort of something that was already stated by a reporting, is the idea of idol worship is, is, is seems to be exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Idol worship during the time of, of Muhammad or seventh century Mecca around the, sort of the sanctuary. I suspect that was quite exaggerated. Interesting. When you read the tradition, mm. you, 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 know, you, you find, for example, in, in some of the Sira accounts, um, as, as, as much as 360 or 365, or you know, the numbers vary, gods or idols in, in, in Mecca, in, in the Kaaba itself, or around the vicinity. But a close reading of the Quran shows that, you know, just to sort of quote, I have this, just some notes here, this wonderful quote, by Patricia um, about um, the idols uh, in the Quran, where, where she says something like, something is amiss because, I can't seem to find it, but anyhow, um, the Quran seems to be quite silent 
on whether the contemporaries of Muhammad, whether the majority of the contemporaries of Muhammad actually engaged in idol worship. It's very interesting. There's no doubt that the Quran mentions idols by name, right? That that is clear. But um, it seems Asnam being the key word here. Is it Asnam more than Authan? Well, it mentions specific names like you know uh, um, Allah al Azza, for example. These are the typical names, and, and the Asnam, of course, is also used. Um, but it seems that whenever a specific detailed account of idol worship is mentioned, that seems to refer to a distant biblical mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. so Not Ab Abraham's context, maybe. Or exactly. Noah, Abraham, and, and other contexts also speaks of, of a certain people. Or nations, for example, some astral worship, but very, very rarely. Um, there's also a great work that was published in 1977 by a Spanish scholar called Javier Tixador. Tixador. Um, let's see if I can find the title here. The, the Pagan God. And what he argues is that from around the 4th century, 5th century AD maybe, there was a move in, in the region, in, in what we now call the Middle East, in the Mediterranean world, towards practical monotheism. Right, and that seems to concur with the inscription accounts, uh, with the epigraphic evidence, because we struggle to find epigraphic evidence in the region that point towards idol worship or polytheism after the fifth century. Right, that's not to say they're not there. We may discover them one day. I, I remember having this conversation with with sort of the doyen of, of, of this stuff, Ahmed Ahmed Jalad, and I think we were in broad agreement that. It's, it, that seems to be true, that seems to be the case, that the evidence doesn't point towards polytheism or any form of, of associationism or shirk in Arabia after 425 AD, the early 5th century. And, and again, there's much evidence, um, epigraphic evidence, literary evidence that seem to suggest um, that is the case. So for example, what I decided to do, what I'm doing now, is I managed to collate all the verses in the Quran that speak or make reference to the Mushrikun or anything to do with Arabian religiosity at the time of Muhammad. Okay. Um, and I have around 400, around 400. And with that, I thought, okay, now time to see if I can create or reconstruct the worldview um, in relation to things like, did they have a pseudo or, or, or semi-legal moral code? Did they have a theology-like commitment? Did they have customs? Did they deal with legal matters? Um, and I, I will list them for you here. I, I sort of just read them from my notes. Okay. So we find the, the pagans, which of course, as you know, um, was a term of abuse. Um, in, in late antiquity by Christians directed at non-Christians in the countryside. Um, but when one deals with the famous late antique um, polemics between Greek philosophers and Christian thinkers, um, sometimes it was the other way around. It was the Greek philosophers who accused the Christians of being pagan worshippers mm -hmm. and polytheists. Mm -hmm. um, it's also worth mentioning that the term, and I was going to come to this, but the term sort of monotheism is a very late construct. Um, in English, at least, it's, I don't think we can, we can trace it back maybe to the 17th century with, with sort of well-known Cambridge Platonists like Henry Moore and others. Um, and, and, and it has been argued by someone like Henry Moore that the term monotheism was super added to an already definable religion. Right, so it was a term of prestige. And one could also argue the same in, in the same case of Tawheed. Um, you don't really find that um, in the Quran in, in, in its current form. So collating all these 400 verses about the Mushrikun, I found that generally as a group, and I will of course show or hope to argue that there were multiple strands or layers of shirk or paganism in Arabia at the time of Muhammad. But generally, a good portion of it believed in God. They believed that there was someone who created the heavens and the earth, one sovereign Lord. They believed he's the sender of rain, as uh, uh, Nikolai and I famously argued, using Arabic uh, pre-Islamic poetry. He was a lawgiver. He had dominion over the cosmos. He was the source of strength and protection. He answers prayers. 
In legal matters, they also had a measure of haram and halal, using those very specific terms. They Can I ask about, about the, sorry to th throw off your momentum there, but on, on the first question of the conceptions about Allah. Uh, um, of course, you bring it on this as well. Well, uh, <laughs> A, a bit on Allah, but not not so much on the pagan engagement with with Allah. And you know, as 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 you allude to, there are many passages in which the Quran says, "Well, if you ask the mushrikun who created the heavens and the earth, they'll say Allah." Do, do you have a sense over whether the when they when the mushrikun thought of Allah, uh, okay. did they associate that with the God of the Jews and Christians of a of a? Of well, a I was coming to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I was coming to I think the verse he mentioned, right? If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth um, and set the, the, the sort of these celestial objects in motion, they would say God. Um, the Quran says even when they sort of set in the sea and, 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 and when they sort of turn towards God in sincerity, but when they come back to land, then they return to their associationism. But, in, in my attempt to try and reconstruct this worldview, so we've mentioned their belief in God. Um, they had a notion, you know, even sort of legal matters. They had a notion of halal and haram, which, as I've mentioned, the Quran speaks of uh, um, a legal or moral code they had where they held certain crops as sacrosanct. Mm. Um, they had dietary restrictions, mm. right? Um, they believed in supernatural um, entities, um, which the Quran is very critical of. That is one of the main, perhaps the chief critical or criticism directed at them by the Quran. Their belief in lesser deities and dad, the Quran calls them. They believed in intercession, ancestral worship. They believed in other cosmologies, such as jinns and demons. Um, some of them, the Quran says, denied bodily resurrection. Others did not. Some of them had a conception of this world and otherworldliness. Um, they had a theology-like outlook. So some of them believed in determinism. They said these actions of ours have already been predetermined, so why should we sort of change them? A few of them, as the Quran attests, also believe in the notion of miracles or probative proofs one brings forward, right? A Burhan-like, clear proof. Yes. Evidential um, miracles. Or, yes. Yep, they also believe, for example, in worship, and, and specifically in worship in, in, in a certain way that brings them closer to God. They had prayer-like or ritual-like customs. They believed in sacred space. They believed in the performance of prayer. They practiced Hajj. Um, Julius Wellhausen famously argued that one of the most palpable, clear-cut vestiges of, of Arabian paganism in early Islam is the Hajj, Different. right? Um, they gave sacrifices, animal sacrifices. In some cases, they would slit the ears of, of the animals in a certain way because they thought that was a, a sacred practice. They believed in child killing as an act of religiosity. They prayed for healthy children. They made vows. They also believed in pious example. In, in a few instances when Muhammad is sort of engaging with them, they say, but we found our ancestors on this path, right? That is sort of the, the custom, the practice of the ancestors, oh, interesting. Yes. right? Um, and in terms, you know, of, of, of um, angels, recognition of angels, some of them worshipped the angels, some of them thought angels were daughters of God, and so on. So with this, what I'm sort of suggesting is that there were at least four layers of paganism or shirk in Arabia. And these were the main interlocutors of Muhammad in the Quran. The very high sort of, um, to quote, I, I can't remember who said this, but it's someone who doesn't work on Islam, but works in Christianity or, or late ancient uh, Christianity. He, he defines this as sophisticated polytheism. So I call it high paganism, right? If we think of sort of a, a pyramid-like uh, shape, and these are the ones who believe in God as, as the rain giver, creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, the one who answers prayers and so on, the supreme God. Um, Montgomery Watt famously termed this um, the sort of Arabian humanism or, or the, the, the Allah as, as sort of the um, uh, high, high, high practice of, of, of monotheism inflected with some uh, associationism. So below, below, high, uh, below high paganism, um, I had identified another layer or another sort of subgroup among the Mushrikun, which I call this worldly paganism. These were the folk that de denied resurrection, 
um, and, and these are the people who denied um, sort of the hereafter. Um, there was a case, for example, um, where Patricia Crone famously uh, wrote on this, and, and she analyzed a number of verses where the, the, the pagans, um, in rejecting Muhammad as a messenger, they didn't reject him on the principle that God sends messengers. They simply said, in our conception, God sends angels as messengers, mm -hmm. not humans, mm -hmm. right? And that led me to believe, of course, well, where did they get this idea from that God communicates with humanity through angels? Very interesting point. Right. And here, of course, yeah. one could clearly point towards Jewish and Christian influences, at least mm. you know, survivals of that. Mm. And the very there are verses which speak about, uh, do you find it scandalous that a man like yourself who walks around in the market and eats could be? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because their idea of a, of a messenger was someone who's supposed to be very elevated. And I think they would say something like, this is how Moses or, or the teachings of Moses have come down to us. Something to that. Because he's I in the know. heavenly realm. When he meets with God at Mount Sinai, he actually enters into the yeah. heavenly realm, according to some Jewish conceptions. Mm -hmm. At the very bottom of this pile, uh, what I would most certainly recognize as idol worshippers. Mm -hmm. And there are sort of uh, uh, references to them um, in the Quran, um, but at the very high end of this are their sort of uh, high paganism. Um, and it seems to me at the moment there is, I would say, it, it was suggested by some, by like Patricia and others, that there's a tension in the Quran between the very high idealized, abstract, radical monotheism that you find in the Quran on the one hand, on the other hand, the Quran's acknowledgement of a wider border cosmology that permits the existence of angels and demons and prophets and, and, and it, it permits practices such as intercession with certain uh, provisos. And I'm trying to sort of account or reconcile this seam in tension. And that's why I, I sort of have given it a tentative title, yes. monotheism and um, paganism. Um, Henry Moore, who I mentioned earlier would, would sometimes say that monotheism and just to sort of read from the notes became an intelligent and a demarcated category after religion became defined as a set of beliefs. So sometimes impose a super added um, on religion. Um, there are some sort of example for those um, who sort of want specific references. There's quite too many here, but I will read one which I found fascinating. Um, and this is um, a verse that reads, um, O believers, do not violate Allah's rituals of pilgrimage, the sacred month, the sacrificial animals, the offerings decor decorated with the necklace, right? Al Qala'id, um, nor those pilgrims on their way to the sacred house seeking the Lord's bounty and pleasure, and so on. And that sort of put in um, a necklace. Yes. Yes. around sacrificial animals That's around the animals because you find that when when you sort of read the work of, of someone like john um, haley uh, who wrote on the nabataean religion yes um, you find references like that in, in late ancient mediterranean um, religiosities um there's another example which i thought was fascinating and it has rarely been studied or acknowledged um and this is when the Quran speaks, um, I think it's um, Al-Ma'idah, uh, chapter three or two. Um, I don't have the reference, I just have the Arabic, um, where it says, when you slaughter your animals, don't sort of stop this practice of placing them on sacrificial stones, nusul, mm -hmm. right? Don't, and don't stop the practice. No, stop that practice. Stop it, stop it. Was, it. Yeah, the Quran was sort of criticizing this, yeah. this pagan practice. So what they would do um, is they would sort of slaughter the animals and they would get their blood and smear it on these slabs or stones mm -hmm. because they sort of had adopted a position which most probably emerged from the, sort of the, the Nabataean uh, uh, mood of religiosity, whereby God cannot be represented by images, but he can occupy the space on a flat stone, right? And the Quran calls this nosal. Right, mm -hmm. and they seems to have do that, and that's interesting because there's a Hebrew uh, antecedent to that, um, okay. uh in Hebrew, where that sacrificial stone was also believed to contain in sort of ancient Israel, 
um, the spirit of the gods, and therefore you smeared your blood there as a sacrificial, um, votive way to draw near to God. And the Quran seems to sort of say, stop doing this. And that seems to be taking place in Arabia at the time of, of Muhammad. Yes. Um, so there's and, and that, a tension between what we find in the inscriptions, which suggest, well, at least it's an argument from silence, but don't give us uh, evidence, at least for uh, uh, polytheism in, in the later fifth and sixth centuries. And the Quran itself seem, seems to reflect ongoing practices with the necklaces and the sacrificial stones and um, yeah. uh, dedicating certain parts of your crops um, to, yeah. to the gods and yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so the one way uh, I, I sort of realized that, that this cannot be referring to one group, because on the one hand, you have folk in Arabia, some of Muhammad's interlocutors, who seem to be relatively sophisticated for 7th century um, Arabs who, you know, uh, as the sources describe them, um, they believed in God, that he has dominion, and so on. And on the other hand, they would do something so clearly and, and patently paganistic. Um, I find yeah. it difficult to believe that this is this one is the group. same group. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and which is why I speak of sort of different oh, layers. It's a really important insight.